Woke up this morning with my mind. I am the Reverend Lukata M. Jumbe, and I am the Executive Director of the Alabama African American Civil Rights Heritage Sites Consortium, and welcome to the Stayed on Freedom podcast. In this part, we return to Mississippi. Thank God for Mississippi. Mississippi is a state that is often talked about for its poverty, for its violence, for its cyclical underdevelopment. But when you look at Mississippi, you also need to see a legacy of freedom struggle, a legacy of those who stood up, a legacy of those who paved the way for us to be where we are today. We say thank God for Roy DeBerry in this conversation and thank God for the state of Mississippi. Let me first just thank you and Miss Ruby uh, for extending the invitation for the consortium to be here with you in your home in Oxford, Mississippi. Uh, this is an incredible honor and a privilege thank for you. us. Thank you. Thank you. We're, we're pleased to, to have you. Uh, the, the history that you have known, the history that you are, and the history that you're making is so directly connected to the work that we do and the work that we're seeking to do. Again, thank you for being here in Oxford. Uh, I was born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, which is uh, about 30 miles from here. Um, people know of Oxford, Mississippi because they know of the events of 1962. Holly Springs, they may be less aware of, except that more and more now people may know more about Holly Springs because it's the, it's the birthplace of uh, uh, the well-known and courageous, courageous Ida B. Wells. Mm. Before we talk a little bit about Ida B. Wells, I think it's important for me to give some do honor to my parents, uh, both my mom and dad and my grandparents. Yes, uh, uh, my grandparents on my mother's side uh, came from Oxford, the place where we are now. Uh, but my grandparents and my grandfather and grandmother on my mother's side moved from Oxford because of condition that they felt at the time and moved to Holly Springs, they felt to be a town that was a little bit more uh, livable for black people. Uh, my mother uh, did not get a chance to finish high school initially. She, she later went on and got her GED and worked for Head Start for many years. She was a homemaker. I come from a fairly large family. There are 11 of us. Hmm. Uh, nine are still alive. Uh, there were six boys and five girls. Uh, my father was a very, very brilliant man. Uh, also had to drop out of school to support, which was not atypical for black families at that time, to support his grandparents. Uh, so uh, he was our major source of, of income, so he dropped out. But all during that period, even though my mother was not formally educated until later, my dad didn't get a chance to get beyond the eighth grade, but they always didn't emphasize the importance of, of education. So in terms of background, that was true of my grandparents as well. Mm. Uh, my grandmother from Oxford, grandfather from Oxford, uh, owned land. Uh, and uh, the land I still own today. So that sense of independence and self-reliance was very important and it's still in our family. So the point was they did not get the formal education that was available. They imparted to us the importance of trying to get as much education, even in a segregated society, as much education as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I have to, first of all, just say uh, to give them their kudos. Thank you for doing that. Uh, even as a young person uh, in high school, uh, and one of the reasons why I think I got involved with SNCC initially, and there was a guy named Frank Smith that came to Holly Strange during the early 60s. Frank Smith. Yeah, which I was around 14, 15 at the time, uh, was the first, I think, organizers per se that I uh, got to know. And Frank was a uh, may have been from Alabama, as a matter of fact, I'm not sure, Georgia. Because one of the things I think is important for us to realize and for, I think impacted me earlier uh, was the, the importance of having a local leader, uh, a local person that you could look up to, a local person that you could respect, a local person that you had, that had courage. And Mr. S.T. Nero mm -hmm. was such a man. He taught in our high school, taught Latin. I didn't get a chance to. Um, take Latin with him, but I just remember his presence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I remember either, even during the early days of demonstrating in Holly Springs, because at the time we had a segregated movie theater, and we 
uh, decided that we were tired of sitting up in the balcony, not in, and the, and the white people sat down on the first level. Mm-hmm. And so we decided uh, collectively one day uh, as students to go downstairs. How old were you then? I would say 14 or 15. 14 or 15. And, of course, the sheriff came in. Uh, name was Flick Ash. He was considered to be a moderate sheriff. Did not arrest us, but put us out. And I, rather than integrate the theater, uh, the theater was owned by a guy named Leon Roundtree. Rather than uh, integrate the theater, they closed it. Uh, hmm. They closed it for black people, but they really didn't close it. And the way we found it out, there was a young lady named, uh, at the time, uh, Mary Ethel. And we said, we're going to test this situation to see whether or not this is now a private club as opposed to a public theater. So she called up in her best Southern voice uh, to inquire about how she could get uh, into the theater. And they told her that she said she only had to become a member. And I think the member was some normal fee, but it was only for white people. So the idea was, you know, even though we decided that we were not going to go to a segregated theater, right. we went in to a quote unquote segregate it. Rather than integrated, they closed it down, except they kept it open as something? a private club. So, what, year, a, what year was that? That was probably 62, 63, okay. somewhere in that, in that range. The, the, let me tell you why I asked you that question. Uh, I, I, I think about what happened in states like Mississippi and Alabama in 1954 following the uh, Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas desegregation case and how... So many people who don't know the full history say, oh, well, in 1954, all the schools in in the U.S. were desegregated, not realizing that how in many states and in many places like in Alabama. And I want to know if you if you have some recollection, because I guess you would have been about eight years younger uh, here in Mississippi. And so you would have probably been in elementary school age. But in Alabama, they closed all the schools. And, and and students weren't able to go to school at all. Instead of desegregating, they simply closed the public schools, but then they created the academy system, the private schools that were just for whites to be able to attend. And it sounded like that sort of reaction to integration or desegregation uh, showed up in a movie theater as well. And exactly, it's exactly. It's actually you mentioned the school because Brown versus Ver- Void. It's true, I was in elementary at the time, uh, had gone to an all-black school called Cedar Grove, mm-hmm. which was a, like a church-related school. But then after 54, my parents moved from the from the county into the town, which was about three miles, and we had an opportunity to go to a school called Rosenwald. Because Rosenwald, Rosenwald schools. schools, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that school had been set up by Rosenwald and Booker T. Matter of fact, there was a tremendous uh, architect from Tuskegee that designed uh, those schools that made them more open, gave them more light, as opposed to the small school like Cedar Grove. But anyway, so we came to Holly Springs to go to Rosenwald and eventually went to a place called Sims. Holly Springs did a little bit differently. Uh, they didn't necessarily open private academy. They had an all-white school that was called Holly Spring High School. Mm-hmm. But what they did was they built a brand new school hmm. uh, for us uh, in 1955 or so, right? So just we, for y'all, just for us, <laughs> brand new school. Right. So so when you looked at it, the, the the school that was the white school was an older building. But what you didn't understand that we saw right away, because people that worked, black folk didn't have access to the school, but they had people that worked at the school, like Janice's and things like that. And they would tell us what was in those schools as opposed to what was in our new school. And so we started to see things like labs that uh, other schools had that we did mm-hmm. not have, uh, the up-to-date books, which this other school had, which we didn't have. We got you know what they call second-handed books, mm-hmm. hand-me-down books. So. The strategy was different, I guess, in different Did you get states. the new books in the new school, or you still got the old books? We got the old books. You got the old books got in the, a new building, in a new but got building. all the, the, the oh, castaway. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So the strategy was to say separate but equal. Mm-hmm. And so the, the issue here was, okay, Supreme Court, you now uh, have to, sort of unquote, desegregate the school system. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to build a brand new school for the black folk. Wow. Right, and let the white folks stay in the other school. So who's going to argue if y'all drive by here and see this beautiful school, and then you drive by the white school and it's the old place? 
because people are not going to bother to go inside to look to see what's in the gut of that of that building. So that's the strategy that Mississippi used. Now in the Delta, though, and which I found out later because I didn't know much about the Delta at the time, the the private academies became a reality. Mm. Okay, we did not have a private academy in Hollis Strain. Later on, they they got one, but that came a little bit later. That came around. Uh, probably the early 60s, mm-hmm. uh, Marshall Academy came along. It was only one as opposed to in all of these places where you had two or three. So, yeah, they had a private academy there, but it's nothing like the Mississippi Delta. There, there was an the idea was, we hope that you'll be satisfied when we build you this new school. So Holland Spring was in this notion about they didn't want to engage in too much violence. They didn't want, that's why you had very few lynching in Holland Spring. I don't know mm-hmm. of any recorded lynching. I'm sure there were black people killed. So the idea was, and you had also a sizable black middle class in Hollis Spring. You had two historical black colleges, Rust College that was founded in the 1860s. Rust College. Mississippi mm-hmm. Industrial College. And Mississippi Industrial College. Which was founded about 1905 or so. Mm-hmm. And so you had a fi- fairly sizable black middle class. So when I was growing up, uh, there were black doctors, there were black dentists, black teachers, black preachers. Uh, matter of fact, I didn't know what a white dentist was until I went to Boston. Because mm. the only thing I ever had was a black dentist. I had never seen a, a, a white doctor because, you know, I was delivered by a midwife until I went to Boston because of Harley Springs had black doctors, mm. right? Uh, the same thing with business folk. When we shopped and needed to buy groceries, Mr. Armstead owned a grocery store. Mr. Henry Freeman owned a grocery store. So we went to black businesses as youngsters growing up in this segregated society. So people say, okay, how did you manage? Well, you managed because you had your world. And then there was the white world. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, you just, you, you, you interacted with your world. And most of the time, you didn't encounter white people. Right. And vice versa. Your world and the white world. Yep. And I wonder if many people outside of Mississippi or Alabama or outside of the South realize that there were diverse communities within Mississippi. Absolutely. Like you see these images in Mississippi, you don't see places that have black dentists and black doctors and black business people and black schools all in one community. Oh, all yeah. you think about is the lynchings. All you think about is the abject poverty. People talk about the fact that black folk couldn't vote. A lot of black folk couldn't vote. But it's also true there were black people in Hollis Springs who were allowed to register and vote. Mm. They were a minority. Because one of the things that the Gentile, one of the reasons why I think the power it be clearly understood is that if we allow a certain percentage of black people to be successful, mm-hmm. that means uh, there's a possibility that they make the argument that things are maybe not so bad because we allow a small percentage to, to do it, even though the vast majority of people clearly did not have the right to vote. Mm-hmm. But did, some were they electing black elected officials? No, there were no, no? black elected okay. officials. In so they were able to vote, but they had to vote for white people. That's uh, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Interesting. No, there were no black candidates running for office. At that well, time. you know, I did. I, I I I raise that up because I think that we oftentimes don't think about the complicated realities of voting. It's one thing for us to have the right to vote, which is essential. It's something that uh, people are encouraged to do. We talk about how our ancestors fought. Mm -hmm. and died uh, for the right to vote. But we oftentimes don't draw a line to the importance of who you're voting for and having candidates that will represent you and having organizations that can hold elected officials accountable. And and so to know that there were uh, those who could vote and there were those that couldn't vote, but the voting rights movement was more than simply just getting people that right It was because there was this belief that if black people are able in mass to be able to vote, we can then organize and we can change government and public policy. Oh, there's no question. And you know, that that change certainly came later. But a little bit of historical context here, I want to talk about my great aunt, uh, Louvenia Webb, Mm -hmm. who who actually... What's her name? uh, Louvenia Webb, W-E-B-B. All right. And uh, they were the one that got the land here in Oxford in 1870, her parents, mm. right? Um, Hannah Jane and uh, Thompson and Lewis Webb, mm. uh, my, my great-great-grandfather and great-great-grandmother. When my great-aunt was born in 1884, I used to ask her, because that, that was just a few years after the, uh, the close of Reconstruction, right? 
So I used to ask her about the train she rode on. She used to take a train from Hollis Springs to Oxford. It was desegregated. It was not. See, Jim Crow really hit hard in the 1890s with the Constitution that we know of, the 1890 Constitution. Mm -hmm. So it's black cemetery. So I asked her, well, what about Can you tell us a little bit about that? Tell us about the what, what happened with the Constitution in, in, in 1890 in Mississippi. Right. Well, you know, there had been the 1866 or so Constitution mm -hmm. in Mississippi, which was a one with Reconstruction, right. which was a very uh, progressive uh, Constitution, if you mm -hmm. go back and read it, right? Mm -hmm. Which allowed uh, for public schools, right? Mm -hmm. Did a lot of things that uh, even the uh, old Mississippi Constitution did not do. Right. The one that existed during before the Civil War, so during that period of, of the 1880s, when my 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 uh, my great aunt was born, and into the late 80s when she was a girl, she was able to do some things that later on was taken away from her. So there was these cycles, right, where you had the Civil War, you had Reconstruction, then Reconstruction, you had a gap, the mm -hmm. the 18 some Constitution, and then the the Constitution that came in 1890 was really the Jim Crow laws, mm -hmm. which says black have to have separate cemeteries. Black cannot do public accommodation that they had been doing in the 1880s, right? So uh, black folk can't own property. Uh, you know, a whole bunch of things they put into, you had the vacancy laws and all that stuff. So the idea was, I just want people to understand that even in Mississippi, there was a period there when black people had some rights mm -hmm. and some freedom of movement, mm -hmm. and then all of that was taken away in the 1890s. Right. And see, and, 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 I'm, and, I'm, and I'm pausing there just for some of our viewers who, who may not have this deep history, because I think we oftentimes rush past it. I think we don't do a, a good enough job in our schools, and we want to protect authentic histories mm -hmm. within the consortium, but people don't follow that track. So 1863, we know we have the Emancipation mm -hmm. Proclamation. They now have created this holiday of mm -hmm. Juneteenth. They mm -hmm. say in 1865, and uh, the, uh, the people, at least of Galveston, Texas, found out mm -hmm. about the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, there were changes that began to be made. You talk about the 1866 Constitution in Mississippi, which began to create some new realities from the the, the, the pre-Civil War Constitution that were a benefit to black people in the state of Mississippi. And but then we also don't realize in that same period, December 24th, 1865 is when the Ku Klux Klan was first formally organized in Pulaski, Tennessee. Right. Uh, when we when we move forward into this period of reconstruction, uh, we also move into this period of what they call our nadir, our lowest point. Mm -hmm. And, and, and so then we begin to see some new realities. And in Mississippi in 1890, there was a new constitution that was formulated that began to institutionalize some new realities. Yeah. For but black in terms people. of black agency, since you mentioned Reconstruction, it was during Reconstruction that Mississippi elected the first black senator in the United States, period. Mm -hmm. right? His name was? Hiram Revels. Hiram Revels. Right, and he's buried in Hollis Springs. He's buried right. in Hollis Springs. Yeah, he also worked at Alcorn uh, University, Alcorn College. So, the so there was a black senator in Mississippi before there was Senator Barack Obama I, in I, Illinois. Absolutely. There was, you know, people could get the impression that there was no activity, but there was always activity. But the pushback was, we don't want you to uh, be in these offices. And therefore, Reconstruction was all about corruption, all about the evil, mm -hmm. all about this stuff that you're doing, black people really don't have any any agency. Well, they proved them wrong. Right. Because these guys were not only elected, but they were successful at right. what they did. But that's the false narrative they tried that's to That's a false forward. narrative. And then in 1890, with this new Mississippi Constitution, there would be there was some some reaction, reinstitutionalization of institutional racism in Mississippi in ways that were had not been seen in some time. Absolutely. And a guy named Montgomery, who was the last elected black official, uh, was elected in the 1890s. And uh, by the way, I think he's a grandfather. And I can't think of a name of the woman who now heads up the Kellogg Foundation. Oh, uh, but okay. he was the last elected black official before, as I say, the, uh, the late uh, 60s or early 70s. No, you're absolutely right. The 1890s was, a, was an attempt in the part of the law to set back all the progress that had been made. And by the way, if you notice that most of these statues that were erected in Mississippi, 
Hall of Fame didn't have one. But he wrecked the Confederate, the Confederate, Confederate staff. monuments, right? Mm -hmm. Those right. things came in 1905, 1906, 1907, mm. many years after the Civil War. That stuff came after the sort of reaction of the 1890s when they reestablished what they call the Lost Cause. Right. Right. So as so so as much as our uh, some of our Confederate leaning white sisters and brothers may talk about, well, this was just about our heritage. This was just about uh, the, 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 the war against Northern aggression, that truly when they started building these monuments and these statues and other things, it was a reaction to black people being empowered, reconstruction, being able to to exercise some real political power in ways that they were reacting against, uh, and and that that pendulum doesn't it keeps swinging, swinging back and yeah, forth. Absolutely, forth. that's part of the mythology. That's part of the false narrative that you talked about earlier. If if in fact if it was all about legacy and all about you know celebrating the the the, the Confederate people that had died, you would do that right after the Civil War. Right. Right. You wouldn't wait thirty or forty years. Mm -hmm. Right. You wouldn't wait until the Jim Crow period. They, you wouldn't wait till the Klan has to reestablish right. itself. Mm -hmm. Then you start to establish that way, the way to put you in your place. Uh, these rights had already been taken away. So why, on top of that, would you want to erect these narrative except to create this false um, of, mm -hmm. uh, symbolism about the lost cause? Right. Thank you, Dr. Roy DeBerry. And thank you for joining us in this episode of Stayed on Freedom. Stayed on Freedom.